Lorraine, thank you. Um, uh, there are, um, on an extraordinary occasion, there are such hot topics around at the moment, topics of conversation, and there's perhaps one particularly hot topic of conversation at the moment, that for me to raise it in such a, um, any of the topics, but the one in particular, for me to raise it in such civilised company, in such glorious um, and elegant surrounds, um, on such a happy occasion, and in the presence of works of art of such consummate mastery and intelligence and brilliant and intoxicating execution, to raise the hot topic of conversation would be grossly impolite. So I won't raise it at all, except I will refer to another enduring and increasingly hot topic of conversation, other than the one in particular, um, and that is broadly defined as cultural appropriation, or otherwise known as identity politics, I think. And it has some kind of glancing but definite nexus in a positive way to Stephen's work, so I'm going to mention it, mention it now. The other one would be impolite. I think this one has a, has a relevance. Now, Cassie and I have just, um, my Cassie, who I think is here, is, is, is um, have just returned, and what a good reason to return, from our short annual break, and this isn't a total diversion from the, uh, from the narrative, from Bali. And we came back and happily to do so for this, although I must say at the airport reading news, we thought, oh, maybe we should stay uh, there. Now, we always go to the quiet, uh, venerable old resort way away from the the, 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 the noisy Seminyaks and Cooters. It's the old resort that Donald Friend had an association with. And we went there and we thought we're just going to absolutely relax, walk, dine, read what we all do on such occasions. And we, we hadn't done any homework on any programs, any exhibitions in any galleries. We thought this is just a pure break. Anyway, we walked in and the beautiful um, concierge said, are you coming tonight to the talk that we have as part of the a satellite event from the Ubud Writers' Festival. We have the very famous and very controversial um, US, um, or UK born, but US, uh, uh, no, US born, but UK resident, journalist and writer, Lionel Shriver. She who was, was, was born Margaret Ann and decided because of her tomboy nature early on that she wanted to uh, become Lionel. So Lionel Shriver was speaking and there was a, a Balinese banquet. We thought, you know, we know of, um, we need to have a word about Kevin and the rest, but I don't think either Cassie or I had actually steeped ourselves in Lionel Shriver's work. But we thought, look, this great and controversial writer, particularly controversial in recent times in this land at the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Do you all recall the, the news, the headlines, when there was quite a, a she made some, um, a, allegedly by some scandalous statements about identity politics an appropriation of cultural images and emblems and mythologies. And it was quite a brouhaha there. So we thought, well, look, we'll go, we're here, and here's this notable identity, we'll go and hear her speak. It was in conversation, it was a, there wouldn't have been this number of people. It was a very special occasion. And uh, whilst she did speak on her new novel, which is The Mandibles, which is about American society in the year 2029, after World War, and the society and the economy in that country has absolutely collapsed, such that the newly elected Mexican president, prosperous Mexican president, is, is building a wall between America and Mexico to keep out fleeing American um, refugees. So she was really, really quite um, wonderful to hear, and we thought this is good. And then she got on to the, the Brisbane an, uh, uh, episode and the controversy there. People actually walked out. No one was going to walk out of the Tanjung Sari dinner with um, you know, Lionel sitting here um, in conversation with um, an Ubud Writers' Festival uh, organiser. And she said, um, she explained why there had been such controversy. And it was because she had opened her remarks talking about an American university where a student organisation had um, arranged a tequila party. Sounds pretty harmless. And at the tequila party, um, uh, those present wore sombreros. And the university said that those wearing sombreros who were not of Mexican heritage uh, were being grossly insensitive and we might indeed 
I think they used the word impeach, presumably expel those students for the university. Her line, not to go on too much for long, was that this was taking things a step too far. Um, but, and at that point, saying this is taking things a step too far, people walked out of her address in the Brisbane Writers' Festival, such that she said, so the moral of the, of the matter here, the, the moral of the sombrero scandal is that one should never try on other people's hats. And one should certainly, metaphorically, um, not pretend to step into their shoes and imagine their experience. And she said, and yet that is precisely what journalists, artists, creative individuals in Oldsmith are doing all the time. And there was a little reference to Shakespeare's doing that, doing that often and grandly. Uh, of course, Dickens doing that, Mark Twain doing that, and so on and so forth. And then it came on, this conversation came on to the fact that in the visual arts, of course, you think immediately of Picasso appropriating, assimilating, borrowing, and using in his own art African and Oceanic sculpture and carvings. Think of the great Demoiselle d'Avignon, where he's the first use of his the heads, which he overpaints on existing, and he's painted virtually African and Oceanic imagery on the heads. He even went a little further and said, um, in discussing what he was doing, he said, I am liber... And I'm quoting, I think, paraphrasing. I'm liberating these images from their original, savage and compelling context in the creation of a new visual language. So he would have, he would have actually yeah, been in very deep water uh, at the Brisbane Writers' Festival <laughs> saying that. Um, and uh, he then said, went on to say, well, this is actually the development of a new visual language. So if there hadn't been notionally, and this isn't a polemic of one or the other side of the argument, I'm just coming round to uh, Stephen's work, if he hadn't culturally appropriated, assimilated, used, there would have been no Demoiselle d'Avignon, there would have perhaps then for been no cubism, there wouldn't have been the modern movement. Glib remark, but that's where we, we sort of... Now, in Stephen's work, there is such a richness, an intelligent selecting and assimilating of such a diverse array of cultural sources, imagery, um, experience, allegories that are assimilated very carefully into these complex, and I would call them epic, epic compositions. And that is really one of the reasons that Stephen is such a compelling artist, that this exhibition is, I think there's a subtitle, Jamais Vous, which is the absolute opposite and polar extreme of the notion of déjà vu. Jamais vu. Uh, I think in, in, I'm not sure, Stephen. If this is this is what I was going to ask you before I was wh whisked away, is the sense of our sensation of seeing an image or experiencing an event and thinking it's in some way familiar, perhaps thinking we recognise it somehow, but in the context we see it now, it seems utterly unfamiliar, even eerie and very compelling. So Stephen has used images and emblems and patterns and philosophies from so many different cultures, from high art, from the East and from the West, from high art, and popular culture, from design, the visual arts, from uh, ethnographic and topographical uh, and natural history sources. And he has so carefully integrated them into these epic new compositions that we see images and we think, ah, we recognise an aspect of that, but I wonder, let, let's say the most obvious one is the willow pattern which appears. We recognise it, but we don't actually recognise that famous little arched um, Asian bridge in the context of the circular quay and so forth. So there's sort of a, a jamais vu. Now, let me just think what I was going to move on to now. I was going to say that the imagery is so brilliantly intricate, so carefully arranged, that one actually should read these compositions rather as one would read a page of richly, beautifully um, inspired, elegant, calligraphic text. The spaces, the gilding, he's actually used wonderful historical techniques and forms. And all of this, the technique, the origins, the trajectory, is so beautifully articulated in Christopher Menz's essay in the catalogue. I commend the catalogue and certainly Christopher's words, which are going into much more um, scholarly detail in, in analysing 
uh, Stephen's work than, than I can do here. It's, it's, it's all there. It's all about paradox because as I said, there's East, there's West, there's high art, there's popular culture. And indeed paradox is there in the tricking of the eye. And late November at the Geelong Gallery, um, it was put in place while I was still there, although it will be now uh, presented um, by uh, my successors and colleagues. There's an exhibition of contemporary trompe l'oeil, uh, paintings, video, um, digital and objects. Um, and the works that trick the eye, which of course is a, a device that goes right back to the Roman era, where Roman some murals, you think, is that actually a glass bowl of fish sitting on a ledge there? And in fact, it's all a trompe l'oeil tricking the eye. So the idea of paradox is very much here and tricking the eye. And this is very much the jamais vu notion, things that are familiar, but not familiar. There's the willow pattern, and as Christopher describes, the references to William Morris, textile design. Now, of course, the Art Gallery of South Australia has, as many of us know, an extraordinary collection of um, Morris design material. Stephen, of course, is Adelaide based and knows it intimately and, and well. And it reminded me that there's a, a very scratchy recording of the poet William Butler Yeats on British radio recalling as a young man an encounter he had, brief encounter, with the great William Morris. William Morris was an idol and well-known, and Yeats is arriving at a big hall out of London where there's been a poetry reading. And those reading the poetry read some of William Morris's poems at the time. And Yeats recalls in this conversation, he says, I bumped into the great man coming out of the hall in a rage. And he said he was talking to his companion. He was absolutely steaming. And he said, it took me a great, this is Morris, recalled by Yeats, it took me a great deal of effort to get those lines and those verses into rhyme. And they've read them the wrong way. And it took me such an effort to do it. And then Yeats goes on to say, because he's about to read on this program, he says, it took me a great deal of effort to get these lines to rhyme. And I'm now going to read, it happened to be the lake, the very famous Lake Isle of Innisfree. I'm going to read them as they should be read in rhyme. Now, I think, Stephen, there's an effortlessness about a lot of Morris's poems. There's an absolute lyrical diaphanous effortless about Yeats's Lake Isle of Innisfree. So too, epic though these are, there's a sense that they have just, all the imagery is assimilated and combined in such an effort, effortless, masterful way. And yet, as we know, there's anything but. There's a colossal, um, epic amount of effort, consideration, thought, musing, meditation, and skill that has gone into these works. And they are just marvelous and majestic. Now, to quote Yeats's uh, first line, I, I, I shall arise and go now and go to Innes Free, etc. I'm going to arise and stand over here now and say, I, it's my great pleasure to be invited to speak uh, about uh, my friend and, and brilliant colleague's work, Stephen Bowers, to commend the exhibition to you and to commend Stephen on the work and Lorraine and your team on presenting it. Thank you.